What did you say? Mark asked. The man at the counter pretended he hadn't heard him, wiping his rag as he returned to business as usual. What did you... Oh, I assumed you knew since you were the one doing it. It's not a very practical habit. I think you'll agree. Mark stood in shock for a moment. How did this guy know about his dirty little secret? Nobody knew. At least, Mark didn't think they did. He'd been so very careful about where and when he did it. Never at school, only at the gym, and if his father wasn't home. Both ways meant that he could immediately brush his teeth, so he didn't have the usual deterioration you saw in people who were practicing extreme weight loss. And he certainly didn't show any of the other signs you saw in those who overindulged. People would have said that there was no sense to him doing it. Mark was in peak physical condition, and he really had no reason to, but that really wasn't the case. But, as his father said, there was always a new peak. It started in ninth grade. Mark had started putting on a little weight, but, but that was normal. Mark knew from health class that as you put on muscle, you gained weight. Mark had been working out, bulking up for football trials, hitting the gym hard all summer, and he had the muscle mass to show for it. That, however, had cut zero ice with his old man. You're up 20 pounds. What have you been doing all summer? Mark had stared confusedly at him until he repeated it, thinking the answer was obvious. When Mark explained it all to him, his father had scoffed, not believing him. No, 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 no. A boy your age shouldn't be putting on that kind of weight. You'll just have to work harder. You, you can't be getting lax now. You're so close, so close to perfection. Perfection had become a mania in his father. It was something that he'd been studying for years, apparently. Something he had tried to achieve when he was younger, but never quite succeeded. He was old now, though, but he thought it might be possible for Mark. He mentioned his weight, his muscle mass, his diet, everything. This sudden weight gain had been nothing to Mark, just the end result of his hard work. But to his dad, it was a catastrophe. He began to comment on it constantly, telling Mark he was letting himself get lazy. He needed to work harder to achieve perfection. If you ever hope to beat that boy, you need to do better. What's his name? Reg or Rand or something? Whoever, if you, if you want to be the best, then you have to act like the best. It had unfortunately taken root in Mark as well. He had doubled down on the smoothies and worked out harder than he ever had, but it didn't matter. He couldn't lose the weight. And as his dad continued to hark on him and his imperfections, he took drastic measures. So he began to purge. So what? Lots of people did it. It wasn't new. It was just once a day. And when his dad congratulated him on dropping some weight, Mark had finally felt some of the pressure come off. So he had treated himself. A little cheat day. But in the end, he'd felt even worse. He could hear his father at the weigh-in the next day already. He would know what Mark had done. He would always know. So, Mark had purged, gotten rid of all of it, tossed it up, left it behind, and the emptiness made him feel better than ever. His father had been happy with his weight, with his growth, with his advancement. And that was when Mark realized he couldn't stop. If he wanted to obtain perfection, he needed the edge it gave him. And if he achieved perfection, then maybe, just maybe... The object of his secret desire would finally take notice of him. It's none of your business, Mark hissed at the man, tossing the corn dog away, his eyes trailing it as it made his mouth water, even from the dirt. You're right, said the man. It's yours. If it's how you achieve your so-called perfection, then it's your cross to bear. But do you really think you'll ever get there like that? 
Do you think it'll make him notice you? Mark took a step back. How did he know? How, how could he know? No one knew. He had never told anyone. It was the worst of his secrets, the one he kept in plain sight. No one could know what his, what his rival truly was, because if they discovered it, he truly would be lost. No matter how you torture yourself, Mark, it's not going to do any good. You know he won't see you that way. Not ever. What choice do I have? Mark asked. I can't tell him. He'll never accept it. I just... I just have to... Have to what? To hide yourself? To deny who you are? To chase a perfection that'll never be something you can achieve? You're chasing self-destruction, Mark. The only thing you'll achieve is an end. And an untimely one, if you keep on like this. You'll come to deny yourself, and eventually, you'll hate yourself. Then it's just a quick descent into destruction. Mark opened his mouth, not sure how to answer this man. What the hell kind of place was this? It's a fun house, Mark. A house haunted not by the ghosts or ghouls that you expect, but by the demons that we carry within us. This haunted place is for self-discovery, for exercising the devils within us. Your demon is denial, and it's one of the hardest to expel. Don't spend your life denying yourself, denying your happiness, denying what could be because of what can never be. Be true to yourself, Mark. Be true and know yourself. Only then can you achieve perfection. Mark lay his head against the counter, wanting to deny him, but knowing that the Barker was right. I've got a lot to think about, Mark whispered. But when he looked up, the booth was empty. Mary sat there, letting their words roll over her as they treated her like she wasn't there. Around her, the people at the table sounded like her parents, like her friends, and the air was filled with those who overlooked her, unimportant, unseen, unloved, unknown. Suddenly she couldn't take it anymore. She, she got up and ran from the cafeteria, heading out into the hall populated by the faceless masses. They sounded like her parents too, like the friends who now looked through her and Mary put her hands over her ears as she looked for respite. They were everywhere. They were surrounding her, mocking her, and as she saw the door to the bathroom, she realized it was her only option. How many times had the bathroom protected her? How many times had she run there when she needed a moment of silence during a long and trying day? She pushed inside now and was glad to find it empty. It was quiet, one of the first places devoid of the noise outside, and she went to the sink as she splashed water in her face. She looked up to find her reflection studying her with an alarming amount of speculation. It was almost as if it moved on its own, independent of her desires. What are you doing? The mirror Mary asked her, causing her to stumble in surprise. She bumped into the door of the stall, eyes locked on the mirror image, as the mirror Mary laughed at her. What's wrong? It's perfectly fine when you tell the mirror your problems, but you don't expect me to talk back? Mary was silent for a moment, contemplating her answer before speaking. I'm sorry, it's just you never did it before. It wasn't as if the mirror had never had the room to speak either. Whether it was the bathroom mirror, the mirror in her room, or the compact in her pocket... Mary often spoke to her reflection when she was alone. Her friends would have listened, but that would have placed the burden on them. Her parents would have listened, but Mary felt their answers would have been little more than lip service. In the end, Mary always felt that she had only herself to rely on, so she shared her problems with herself, and that was where they stayed. Mirror Mary smiled. Maybe I've never had anything to say before. Mary chewed that over, finally nodding as she supposed that could be so. 
Where are you hiding, Mary? She asked, leaning to put her forehead against the glass. I don't know. I don't know why it should bother me so much that no one sees me. After all, I've been invisible nearly all my life. Why would anybody notice me? But no, that wasn't right. Her friends had never made her feel that way, and they were some of the few people who did see her. She was no ghost with them. They had never seen her as such. Mirror Mary smiled. Exactly. Your family will never get there, but your friends seem to have figured it out. They value you in a way that no one else does. And if they can, then why not others? If you act like a ghost, then people will treat you like one. So don't be a ghost. You're the main character of your story, Mary. Go live your life. B but, Mary said, some of the doubt returning, what if that changes? What if, what if they come to see me as nothing but a nuisance? Then find others who can see your value. But I don't think they will. And I don't think you think they will either. So go back into that cafeteria and see your friends. They won't wait forever. Mary smiled, practically running to the bathroom door as she threw it open. But it wasn't the school that waited for her outside. It was the blank walls of her own home. And when she turned around, Mirror Mary was nowhere to be found. The cornstalks smacked at Reggie's face as he ran after the voice that he remembered from so long ago. He had tensed when he saw something moving in the corn, but when he had looked up, his blood had run cold. It was her. She had been sitting there in the corn like the world's most grotesque yard decoration. He had stood up as she pulled herself back in, but she had been gone as he gave chase. It couldn't be her. Melody had died 13 years ago, and it was his fault. As the stalks battered at him, he knew it was less than he deserved. He deserved to be scourged by those stalks, pummeled to bloody ruins. But his punishment had never come. He had lived with the guilt, with the knowledge that if it hadn't been for him, she would be alive. She had never dated, never gone to high school never even graduated middle school. Reggie had stolen all that from her with a couple of seconds of inattention. As he broke through the corn, Reggie found himself on the edge of a massive graveyard. As he looked at the headstones, he heard the voice of his long-dead sister once again. Reggie, she half-whispered, drawing him into the rose as he searched for her. She couldn't be here. She had been laid to rest at Hedris Gardens over on 11th Street, but he would never forget that voice. She had begged him just that way as she lay there, broken and bleeding in the street. They had cleaned her up for the funeral, enough to have an open casket at least, but the damage was done for Reggie. No amount of makeup could cover the track across her face, the arm jutting up at an odd angle or the way she had breathed against the puddle she lay next to, sending ripples up and across the surface. They had been coming home from school, and Reggie had been hamming it up. He was almost six, and to him, he was invincible. He could be hurt. The universe had proven that last year, when he had almost broken his foot, but the idea of dying was as foreign to him as flying. He was young, and he would always be young. Adults were old because they had always been that way, and the idea that he might become one of them was laughable. He had been walking on the guardrail that separated the road from the sidewalk, and Melody had been yelling at him to get down. Get down, Reggie. If you fall into traffic and get hit by a car, Mom will never let me hear the end of it. Reggie hadn't listened to her. Melody was 11, and she thought she knew everything. So what if she was in charge of him after school? She was just his big sister. She wasn't mom or dad. He ignored her, feeling the solidity of the metal beneath his feet as he balanced. It was fun, and Reggie wanted to see how far he could go before he had to get down. I said get down, Reggie. You're gonna... She had stopped when she heard the engine revving up ahead. 
Reggie never saw the car as it barreled towards him. He had seen a cool bug walking on the rail, the two of them meeting in the middle, and as he prepared to step over it, he was suddenly shoved very hard into the road. It all happened in slow motion, Reggie falling like a leaf from an autumn tree, and when he hit the pavement, he skinned both hands and the side of his leg. He had sat down, already crying as the pain jagged through him, and started looking around for Melody. You pushed me, he yelled querulously, as only a five-year-old can. Why did you... But that's when he noticed the back half of the car as it stuck out of the ditch. He could see it because it had gone straight through the guardrail and was ticking and smoking from between the brake and the metal. The driver would turn out to be dead, the man having lost control of his vehicle due to a malfunction. But that was for later, and the body in the street was for now. The body of his sister, Melody, was laying in a heap near the rail. The car had passed completely over her, crunching her legs, her arms, twisting her neck, bloodying her nose, and leaving a tire tread across the right side of her face. She was shuddering into death, her breath sounding ragged and forced as she tried to make her deflated left lung work. There was a puddle of something beside her face, a dirty circle of water with a crushed cigarette butt floating in it, and her final breath was sending ripples through it. Reggie, she rasped a single time, her good eye turning to him a single time before going out forever. A different car had found him in the road, crying for his dead sister and for the unwanted knowledge that death could come for anyone. It was one of the most important events in Reggie's life, and for better or worse, it had made him into the person he was now. That sounded macabre even to him, but it really molded all the decisions Reggie made from then on. If Reggie was taking chances, if he was doing something foolish, if he was doing something unlawful, if he was doing anything that a parental figure might think was unworthy, he would hear that raspy whispered voice and he would fix his course. He hadn't heard that raspy voice when he finally told Jazzy how he felt, and that was a big reason that they were still together. The dreams were there too, should he forget his slip-up, as if he needed a reminder. One of the gravestones clipped his leg, and Reggie went down, his face smushing against the fresh dirt over one of the graves. He looked up, earth falling from his cheeks, to see the name on the headstone, Melody Rivers, beloved daughter. Reggie scuttled away, panting as he tried to make sense of it. This couldn't be here. Why would they put this here? Melody was buried miles from here. It, it made no sense to... The ground began to shake, and the earth he had fallen into suddenly began to sink into the grave. It was replaced by water, dirty water, with a cigarette butt floating in it and the level was rising to the very edge of the grave plot. The ripples from the middle hit the turf, the same ripples Melody had made before she died. And when something rose to the surface, Reggie felt his teeth clack together as he tried to make sense of it. It was like every nightmare he had ever had after the accident, a nightmare he was glad to see end when he was 14. The corpse of his sister had moved plenty in his nightmares. Every night he was back in the road, his hands and legs bleeding. As he watched, she would drag herself across the road, whispering his name as her bloody body left a streak across the ground. In his nightmare, Reggie couldn't move, couldn't scream. He just watched her get closer and closer, seeing her one good eye look at him with hatred. He would always wake up before she got him, but he always feared the time that he wouldn't. Today, it appeared that she would get him at long last. She was crawling out of the grave, 
dripping water from her funeral garb. She was a horror, worthy of the movie screen. All the work the coroner had done on her was gone. All the rouge and paint in the world couldn't fix her now. She was the same wheezing corpse that he had seen when he was five, and as she pushed herself up on the lip of the grave and glowered at him, Reggie kept backtracking, the grass and the gravel grating under him, before he finally came up short against the tombstone in the next row over. Reggie, she rasped, the two of them staring at each other over a long moment before she did something that she had never done before. She spoke again. You have to stop blaming yourself for my death. What? Reggie asked, the gravestone against his back, cold and unyielding. I am not your failure, Melody rasped, pulling her broken lips into a smile. You were my greatest success. I saved you, and I did it without a thought. I didn't save you, however, so you could blame yourself for me. Go. Live your life free of guilt over me. You deserve better. You deserve not to weigh every decision against my sacrifice. Go. Be your own person. Enjoy your life. Reggie didn't know what to say, could only sit and gape at her as she smiled lopsidedly at him. I take this burden from you now and forever. Live your life outside my shadow. I love you, Reggie. I always have, and I always will. That's why I kept you safe, so you could go and live your life. She sank back into the grave then, the water retreating as the dirt came back up to fill it. Reggie just sat there, panting as he tried to make sense of all of it. He had to admit that some of the weight he had been feeling was gone, some of the burden lifted. His soul felt lighter. Maybe, he thought, he could live without Melody at long last. Reggie! He looked back at the field of corn, a fog that had enveloped his mind beginning to lift. Jazzy, he he had left Jazzy behind. He turned to head into the corn to look for her. But that was when things began to change. You're still here. Thanks for stopping by. Dr. Plague here. Always a pleasure to see all my new and old viewers coming by for another one of my spooky tales. If you'd like to support the show, you can always take part in one of our channel offers through Fume or Aura, or you can just click on another video when they come up. I'd really appreciate it. For our newer viewers, we also have lots of playlists and other things if you'd like to get caught up. I know some of my series have been going on for quite a while. If you'd like to get my latest book, there's a link down below that'll take you to my Amazon page. Towsy Homestead just came out, so if that's something you'd like to get your hands on, go ahead and have a look down there. If you'd like a signed copy, you can go ahead and email me from my email address on the site, and I'll get with you about shipping information and ship you a signed copy. If you'd like to support the channel in a more monetary fashion, we also have membership through YouTube, and we've got a Patreon that you can get the information for in the description. We have lots of tiers and everything to suit your needs. Patrons that support on the $10 tier, that's our Ghostly Reader tier, get a book anytime I write one, signed and on their doorstep. As you may have noticed, there's a list of patrons and members on the screen, and I'd like to personally thank every one of them for taking a hand in the future of this channel. Well, that's enough for tonight. Dr. Plague, signing off. Have a wonderful evening.